Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is The Sustainable Leader. I'm the editor of The Sustainable Leader. And with me today, we're joined by Sir Mark Moody Stewart, the former chairman of Royal Dutch Shell, one of the world's largest companies, as well as the current vice chairman of the UN Global Compact, a voluntary association and strategic policy initiative of businesses to improve human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. He is also currently the lead director of Accenture, the Dublin-based consulting firm, the director, a director of Saudi Aramco, chairman of Hermes Equity Ownership Services, and chairman of the Global Compact, Compact Foundation, and the Innovation and the, okay, and the Innovative Vector Control Consortium. Sir Moody Stewart has finally decided to share his experience with, experience with us over his 45 years of his, in the extractive industries, and has recently completed a book, Responsible Leadership, Lessons from the Front Lines of Sustainability and Ethics. So I'd like to welcome you, Sir Mark. Thank, Thank you for you joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. And I have to say that I'm extremely impressed. You are a very busy man. Um, so where did you find the time to write a book <laughs> of all these things you've been doing? Well, it, uh, I wrote it at weekends at home. It took about three years. Uh, it was kind of, uh, I don't know, therapy, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Okay, so a main theme of your book appeared to be trust and cooperation, which I very much appreciated. Um, and I'd like to know what you think are the best ways to approach uh, this, these concepts of trust and cooperation. Well, I think the, the first thing is one needs complete openness. I mean, we learned that in Shell. As I describe in the book, 1995 was not a good year for Shell. We had the Brent's Bar uh, event of uh, the disposal of a, a platform, a storage boy, actually, in the North Atlantic, although people always describe it as being disposed of in the uh, North Sea. Uh, and we thought we'd consulted, but we plainly hadn't, uh, not sufficiently. Uh, so I think what one needs, and then we also in Nigeria had the, the event of the issues in Nigeria and the execution by the Abacha regime of, of Ken Sarawiwa. I think what we, we learned there, and I certainly learned, was the need for, if you want to build trust, you need transparency. And uh, Shell is, a, a, is, was, a very analytical sort of company. So when we hit this wall of, of public outrage and disapproval, we thought, actually, we were doing a pretty good job. We had, had uh, principles in uh, operation for 30 years or more from the 70s, which we thought were pretty good, but plainly, uh, the rest of the world either thought our principles weren't any good or else they thought we were not living up to them. So we went into a big global uh, consultation. And I thought we did it in groups of, of uh, 24 people, 12 shell folk, cross-section, young and old across the company, uh, and 12 outsiders, uh, media folk, NGOs, journalists, politicians, academics, uh, opinion formers, uh, and we did that in very many different countries. So, uh, and I thought that we were going to get really beaten up uh, by some of these folk, but actually nobody refused to be interviewed, even, uh, I mean, to join the, the process. And we asked them what they thought were the uh, the characteristics needed for a major global company in the, the end of the 20th century. And I think that taught us how much engagement with people and how much you learn from, from people. And they were very interested in the process. So if you get alignment with people, you're actually both looking after the same thing. You may disagree with how to do it, so I think that's the beginning. And then when we went back, having modified our principles somewhat, not a great deal, we added some things. We uh, then went back to them and they said, that's fine, but it's just words. So can you report to us how you're doing? And that was our, in Shell, our first sustainability report. Well, thank you very much for that. That's very interesting. Uh, I like the concept of process and transparency. That's very good, um, uh, very good points. 
Um, so one of the criticisms that has been, has been made about your recent book is that it doesn't really address the issues of sustainability, as you just mentioned, the, the follow-up. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to voice a counter-argument to this. Um, how would you, first of all, define sustainable development, and what do you think should be the top prior priority towards reaching this? Well, I, I personally don't think you can, can beat the original Brundtland definition of sustainability, which is uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. It actually makes plain that it's not a frozen uh, thing. It is development. Change is needed. And uh, that, I think, was a great contribution. But the question is, can we deliver the change to better people's lives without endangering uh, the future? And in general, for much of my career, I thought that that was clearly possible. We were supplying energy, uh, economic energy, absolutely essential to development, uh, income for, for countries and so on. But then, you know, along came the concerns about climate change. And for the first time, I mean, we knew that there were what you might call local environmental effects, and, and these could be serious. But they were manageable. Uh, but then you find that the, the very act of the energy that we produce, the, the embedded carbon, is having an, an impact on, on climate. It's astonishing, I think, that something as puny as us uh, humans can, can have such a global impact. <laughs> but nonetheless, it does seem to be so. And uh, that kind of... Uh, adds an extra challenge because that's clearly something where we are endangering uh, the ability of future generations to be. We're delivering a benefit, but the benefit has this embedded risk in it. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's something that we struggle with and struggle with how we make the transition. You can't just turn it off overnight. Uh, we don't have enough of, of alternative energies and uh, in many cases many people think that, that it will be some decades before we can really do that uh, but uh, that's a, a I think a major threat and it's one which certainly Shell and BP acknowledged in, in the late 90s in 97. We always have an argument about who said it first, but <laughs> actually it was more or less at the same time. Uh, John Brown of BP said it rather more elegantly than we did. We, we were rather formal about it in our annual report. <laughs> so from what I understand, you're saying that energy and how, how it relates to climate change are the top priorities you see regarding sustainable development. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. I think, I think it is development. We need to deliver better lives to, to people. They need energy to do that. But I think it's, and that's why in, in the book, I do have a chapter on, on climate change. I mean, we, we couldn't, uh, you couldn't as an old man write a book without a chapter on, on climate <laughs> I don't know that I said anything original. Nothing much has changed for, uh, in the past 15 years, unfortunately, mm. uh, for a variety of mainly leadership failures, I think. But then I also, in the book, talk about the other major challenge, which I think is, is uh, and I've been slightly criticized for saying that that's uh, perhaps an even bigger market failure, the, the issue of corruption. Mm. Yeah, I very much appreciated that part of your book. And to the readers, for future readers, I definitely suggest you look into the corruption aspects of his book. Um, very uh, intriguing. Um, so regarding the failure of leadership, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, um, and this issue of energy and climate change as a sustainable development issue, um, who do you think should actually lead the charge towards sustainable development? Corporations, government, NGOs, individual consumers? Uh, who, who do you feel should be the, the primary pusher of this? I think, I think you need uh, a combination of 
interaction between civil society groups, corporations, and governments. Uh, it's, there's a tendency for everyone to shift the blame slightly to somebody else, uh, to say, well, the governments aren't doing it. Governments won't, in democracies, do things which they feel will lose them votes uh, or damage the economy. Uh, so they kind of say, well, you know, we're going as fast as we can, but there are issues with, uh, with either voters or, or business. Uh, business always hides behind the fact that, that you can sell, uh, you can only sell what consumers actually in the end want to buy. A, a, a story I mean, regarding uh, Henry Ford. Yeah, it's actually Bill Ford, the uh, Bill Ford, you know, his grandson, I think. And he was uh, uh, he got in trouble with the. It's what I call the Bill Ford dilemma because he got in trouble with. He was pushing sustainability, but he then got in in slight trouble with the with the uh, investors who said, you know, these massive SUVs are, are what you make most money out of, and and uh, so what are you doing playing them down, as it were? I think we need this combination, and I think the most essential thing is for business people to uh, press for what I call intelligent regulatory frameworks. So frameworks which don't tell us what to do, exactly what to make, but set the objective. So they, for example, efficiency mandates or cafe standards, and they plainly, uh, or, or building regulations. Uh, now, unfortunately, particularly on the western side of the Atlantic, uh, regulation is deeply unpopular. I think it's less so in, in Europe. Uh, and as a result of which we've seen, you know, vehicle regulation and, and so on, having significant impact uh, on automobile efficiency. And it allows people within those frameworks to, to deliver the, uh, the most efficient, most convenient, most uh, uh, utility full uh, option. Uh, and I think if you have business and civil society working together on that as to what's reasonable, not complete revolution overnight, you actually get uh, progress. I mean, look at, at incandescent light bulbs. I mean, if you, if, you know, people are not going to, to some people, there's a percentage of the population who will buy more efficient light bulbs, but a lot of people will just buy what's easiest, cheapest, and what they're used to. Mm. But there's no reason why with a regulatory framework you can't gradually phase something out. Uh, the danger of that is that regulators, by their very title, like regulating, and they tend to, to go a bit too far instead of saying, uh, look, we need uh, less carbon intense technologies without telling us what they are, uh, they tend to say, no, we need solar energy or wind power or whatever, tidal power. They get, so they start saying, we need a bit of that and a bit of, of the other. And that's why I'm an enthusiast for carbon markets, because I think carbon markets actually, they are complicated uh, and they do work. Uh, they work as long as people don't, you know, cheat. Uh, and it's not just companies cheating, it's governments. I mean, the, the failure of the European, the initial failure was governments misallocating the uh, the credits to start off with. Uh, 
by a lot of special pleading, leave this industry out, leave the other industry out. But once it had been set up, the next failure was actually governments concerned about the economy not squeezing the cap down. So as the economy turned down, there was plenty of, of room under the cap, so the price tanked. Uh, and this is a, an intellectual challenge. But it's those kind of market mechanisms uh, which you folk in the States, of course, are extremely keen on. And, and in a way, you know, with sulfur trading and so on, sulfur dioxide, you invented it. Uh, but now it's it's got a kind of uh, carbon trading has a bad reputation in the States, although many major companies support it. Uh, personally, I think the Chinese are trying it and they're, you know, they're very smart. So I think they may... Uh, they may deliver something with it. Thank you very much for that. So from what I understand from what you just mentioned before we as well, before we lost our connection, um, is that uh, corporations, governments, NGOs and a variety of players need to work together in order to keep each other in check, if you will, a sort of yeah. check and balances. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And and we've seen cases where something has less impact. Uh, the Confederation of British Industry in, in the UK had a, a, a panel of companies including steel plants, uh, supermarkets, utilities, energy companies, and they all came out with actually what were very good findings, uh, saying we need clear carbon pricing, we need a carbon price. Uh, but then, uh, being the Confederation of British Industry, instead of getting civil society in with them uh, before coming out. They just issued the report and then waited for a, a reaction. And the problem with business doing it on their own and then announcing it is someone's always going to pick a hole in it. You know, so, so you're better to, to get together first. And let's face it, people, if business suggests something, like a lot of people out there will think, well, there must be something in it for them, you know, it's, uh, and they're a bit suspicious. Well, if we have a bunch of civil society organizations who are more trusted, uh, uh, it in working together, it improves the credibility. Thank you very much for that. Uh, one of the things that I noticed in your book when I was reading it is that, that you focus very heavily on ethical dilemmas. Uh, you just uh, discussed them in great length, which I very much appreciated. Um, and what I'd like to ask you is more for a younger crowd. Uh, what advice would you give students and young professionals to help them deal with uh, these ethical, ethical dilemmas uh, in their own careers? Uh, do you have any tips they might, uh, that might help them along to become better leaders or? I think, I think the, the, uh, the answer is to, to kind of concentrate on the values before the, the dilemmas hit, as it were. If, if in a, any organization you've sat down together, and this in Shell was somewhat forced upon us, uh, to sit down with people outside the organization to say, okay, what are the, the values? What are the kind of rules that we'll uh, sit by uh, or work by? Uh, then I think you're you're in a much stronger position when the, the dilemma arises. Uh, it won't necessarily completely help because in, in some cases, uh, what you're really heading for is, is sometimes is the, the, the least worst option, as it were. It's, it's, it's not a clear cut win all round. Uh, I think one of the things I've found is that if if you're open with the public and discuss the dilemmas, uh, and you can uh, people begin to understand, and they may not agree, but they can understand your your uh, rationale. Let me give you an example. I mean, one one of the things 
that there was a point in the, I think in the in the nineties, where the the common method of uh, breaking up very large tankers, which were single hulled and beyond their useful life, was to take them and run them up on a, a beach in Bangladesh, where people swarmed over it and chopped the tankers up, and they reused every little bit of it. I don't know whether you've ever been to Dhaka, but if you go there, you can see all sorts of lovely things which came off ships, bells and toilets and mirrors. and I mean, they really reuse everything. But it's, uh, it's unsafe. The people crawling over it were not wearing safety boots. Uh, the uh, and it's it's a major industry. It's an important export, important then export industry for for Bangladesh. And I was there last year, and I was amazed to see that they're still at it. <laughs> but in Shell, we said, look, it's very difficult to to break these big tankers up. It's a benefit to to Bangladesh. But maybe the answer is before you do that to make sure you taken all the asbestos out in in uh, Western Europe with people in moon suits and so on, to take all the PCBs out of the transformers on the ship, to remove all the toxic stuff, mm. and then try and make sure that the guys doing it, who were not working for Shell, were, uh, you know, properly equipped. Now, that's, that's, Kind of, uh, it's uh, it's not it's not a perfect solution. Uh, <laughs> but if you simply said we're going to stop doing it now, it, it would uh, cause great hardship in in Bangladesh. And frankly, there wasn't the capacity anywhere else to do it. Hmm. Well, thank you for that. So, um, moving on to a little bit different of a topic. Uh, in your book, you state that this is that it. It is not the place of a corporation to implement political change in countries that they are working in. Um, we've discussed uh, how do you make a change, how do you make a transition. But um, I understand your position on this. Yet you show time and again uh, how corporations have been have to be responsible in the way they act and conduct business, as we were just speaking. Um, so, what do you believe should be the goal of corporations? Uh, is it only to make a profit? Is there something more to that? Um, what do you think should be the primary goal of a corporation? I think that the the primary goal of a corporation is actually to to produce goods and services which which people want, and if you don't do that, you're never going to make a profit. Uh, but it's it's very easy if you go back to you know Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, and so on. If if you take his archetypal baker, you know the baker is a is a simple guy. He's well integrated in society, and is they, he knows that if he if he doesn't look after his customers, they're not going to buy his bread. Mm -hmm. So he's probably going to, you know, if there's someone in the village having a bit of a tough time, he'll probably give them a bit of extra bread and and look after them because he's integrated in society. When you scale that up. It's, it's a bit the same, only just very much more complicated. We can't do good business in a society which is, which is fractured. So it's very much in our self-interest and in the long-term interest to assist in solving some problems. Uh, within, it's a bit like us personally, you know, there are so many problems, so many things we could help with. We can't do it all, so we pick things which relate to our skills. And cooperation should be the same. It's what what can we use our particular corporate skills, be they, be they energy or marketing or pharmaceutical, you know, what can what can we do which is related to our business? which is in line with our values and is in the long-term interest of the business. I mean, in the original Shell principles, uh, the guy who drafted them was a man called Jeffrey Chandler in the 70s. And he actually talked about stakeholders, except in the 70s they weren't called stakeholders. 
but he talked about responsibility to our customers, to uh, our employees, to governments, to society at large, and, and so on, and to shareholders. And he said our obligation, and it's still in the, it's been slightly adapted, but if you go on the Shell website, it's still there. Uh, our obligation to our shareholders, the original version was to deliver an adequate return on their investment and to protect its long-term value. And it's the protecting its long-term value. So it's not maximizing profit. It's, it's, it's a long-term uh, thing. Uh, I think the current word is, uh, which you could have a long discussion on, is to deliver a competitive return to our investors. That's a little bit different from acceptable. <laughs> Not that much. <laughs> I, I bet they scratch their heads over it. That's post my time anyway. Uh, but still to maintain the value of their investment. And frankly, that's what people really want. They don't, they want, you know, they don't want to lose their money. So getting a, a reasonable return, nothing too exciting, but not having periodic crashes is actually a good deal. So I have to uh, say that I do appreciate the concept of the principles that Shell has laid out, um, as well as your own uh, statement towards those. Um, what I'd like to, to know or ask your opinion on is, do you think that those principles have permeated throughout the company itself or in other corporations as well and their principles? Or what, I guess what I'm looking at here is, uh, do you feel it's gone from the top leadership down into the actual organization or not? It, uh, it's, it's variable. Uh, I mean, I always used to say in, in Shell, we had these quite well developed principles. And if you, and you know, everyone in the company signed off that they'd read them, we talk about them. But if you ask people what Shell's principles were, a Shell person, they would say, we don't bribe people. And they could say, we don't bribe people because we talked about it and we gave examples of where it had cost money or we'd lost a contract. I'm not saying that nobody in the whole corporation ever was, uh, you know, hadn't bribed somebody because you have an enthusiast somewhere who thinks, you know, he can fix something. But in general, people knew that and they knew they'd get fired if they were, you know, if they did. Uh, so we don't bribe people and we don't get involved in politics. Well, it's the not involved in politics, which we've somewhat modified because our interlocutors said, you mean you're not involved in, you don't get involved in politics. You're a major political actor. So we said, well, that's not what we meant. We, so it was modified to party politics. But when it came to human rights, we didn't talk about it. So it hadn't penetrated. And one of the examples I give in the book is uh, people always say, you know, we put safety first before everything else. But if people don't see that costing you money in the short term, they don't believe it. They, it's not that they don't hear the words. Uh, and I try and give an example of that where I wrote something and sent it around, you know, the, the exploration and production world of Shell. And I found people still in town hall meetings saying, Mark, aren't we still uh, sending mixed messages on production versus safety? And it wasn't that they couldn't read. Quite frankly, they weren't quite sure, which is very sobering, whether whether I was just saying it, whether they believed me or not. So then you have to convince people and give them examples. Look, this thing, we shut it down because. Uh, and some of the events that have happened uh, was quite clearly uh, because people the, the signal was not clear. The same with respect for people. If you say, 
our prime value, which almost every company is, is, is respect for people. And then you have uh, folk who deliver very good economic performance, but are sheer brutes. I mean, they're bullies, awful. Uh, and if you let, if, if you don't fix that, and in the end, fire them if need be, people say, yeah, well, it's okay, you know, to, to, to beat people up uh, as long as you deliver the results. And people, one mistake like that sends racing round uh, completely destroys the credibility. So it's hard work. So for the, the young people you were talking about, I think that's the thing. You want to, in the company, question it if you think the wrong signal is being sent. And don't, don't accept it when, when your boss says, but I made it quite plain. You, you have to say to him, yeah, you did make it quite plain, but what we're doing over there is not in line with it. Uh, <laughs> that may be a bit brave for some people, but I think it's necessary. Thank you very much for that. Um, I liked your, your point about the uh, corporations being political actors um, and, and uh, realizing that they are political actors, particularly Shell and corporations of that size. Um, in your chapter, Dining with the Devil, uh, that's a pretty remarkable chapter, I have to say. Um, you were sitting down and doing business with people that many Western leaders would not, not, not even hold official meetings with. Um, I have a couple of questions regarding that. One, how difficult was it doing business with these people? And two, why is it that business can find common ground to work on problems while governments often refuse to do this? Well, I think businesses between businesses have uh, there is a kind of language of business, and people understand it. Uh, I mean, uh, I, my wife and I just, for actually the first time, visited Israel and Palestine, uh, you know, Israel and the West Bank and, and so on. And, you know, there's some things there which are, are not too hot, uh, in fact, downright discouraging. But there are some things when businesses work together, uh, Israeli, Jewish Israeli businesses and Arab Israeli businesses, you think, wow, that could really work. I mean, and so there is a kind of uh, common language. I think the, the problem in general is that we, the public, feel that if something's going wrong, someone should do something about it. And they probably should, but I think business by engaging and uh, demonstrating through examples of responsible business that there is another way, I think you can actually make progress. But I'm not pretending that it's easy because uh, I, I say I think responsible business should be engaged. Then the answer is how do you know they're really responsible? Uh, and that you come back to trust and transparency. So I think to me if if a business was engaged in a is engaged in a company uh, in a country and there are lots of countries which things are far from perfect uh, you provided you're open about what you're doing and you're responsible to someone shareholders, a public company, you have consumers in the West who will hammer you, civil society keeping a good eye on you. I think that helps to keep us responsible. Thank you for that. So now I gathered from your book that uh, you were writing for a younger audience. Um, is this correct or was there another segment of society that you were focusing on? No, I, I uh, you know, I mean, I've given a lot of talks in my life to and people, uh, people in business schools and so on always say, you know, well, we, it's really nice to have some, some examples that we can get our teeth into and, and talk about. So it was partly for business schools, uh, but it was also partly so that people could, could see that 
actually business is not just about profit, it is complicated, it requires thought, uh, you don't always get it right, but it's also fun. <laughs> uh, Thank you for that. So. Um... How did you originally envision this book? Did it? How did it change uh, throughout the publishing process and your own, uh, I guess, insights as you were writing? Well, uh, it changed. the 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 first thing that changed was was the title because my original title was uh, "Lessons from a Life on the Move." My wife, uh, Judy, edited, or actually. Uh, put together two books on uh, stories from families of people of all nationalities working in Shell around the, the world. And the first one she called Life on the Move, or they called Life on the Move, and they were written in multiple languages, and they're, they're extremely good stories. And the second one was a slice through the the uh, company at or, or, or through the world, as it were, at one time. So, so the first one covered from you know the 1920s changes in in. Uh, so it was my title was that partly as a kind of uh, little homage to her, <laughs> uh, but uh, the the publisher John Stewart said Mark. If you Google, uh, I was going to call it Lessons from a Life on the Movie. He said, he said, just Google Lessons from. He said, there are thousands of books. Uh, so he came up with this responsible leadership, which, uh, you know, I find a little bit, uh, yeah, it sounds, uh, he actually came up with something called The Responsible Leader. And I said, you're not having that on a book with my photograph on the front. <laughs> Otherwise, it sounds as though I'm saying that's me. Uh, so that was step one. The, the next thing was we had a huge argument about the, the, uh, the sort of personal history bit, which I was felt quite strongly should go in a piece of the back and you could either read it or not. It was much longer, and uh, he was quite brutal. He made me cut that down. He said, no, no, that's far too long. Uh, but he also did a lot of just nitty-gritty stuff, saying, you know, you need a footnote. You need another footnote. You know, you have to explain this. Uh, and I said, fine, I'll do the footnotes uh, on one condition, that you don't make them end notes, because I hate End notes. You know, I, you get a, a number and you <laughs> go to the back of the book and find which chapter which you've forgotten, which chapter you're reading. Anyway, he did that. So I think that was beautiful. Actually, I really appreciate the, uh, the the footnotes. Uh, end notes would have been horrible. I might have put the book down. So. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so good. That, the footnotes are actually mostly his demands. Uh, I mean, he said footnote needed footnote. The bit I, the battle I lost was on on one occasion I wanted a pie chart and he said you can't have pie charts. So, so my son was reading it. He said this doesn't make sense. Uh, there was something about oh it's distribution of taxes. And he said it doesn't make sense. So I said, he said oh no it was member I think membership of of signatories to the UN Global Compact and I said. Oh, I know why it doesn't make sense, because there used to be a pie chart in there which covered all of these things. <laughs> Wonderful. Anyway, I'm not going to write another book, so you're quite safe. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to uh, say, you mentioned your older brother George a number of times in the book, um, and his work on anti-corruption, and as a founding member of Transparency International. Um, I found your relationship with him to be very interesting, and I, I would like to ask your thoughts on how your relationship with your brother uh, had affected your approach to your own work. Um, are there any? Also, are there any other individuals who you believe also strongly influenced your views, uh, and how? So, oh, there, there are lots of, of others. No, no, my brother George certainly did. I mean, he he was he was actually in the in the sugar industry around the world. So he worked in Fiji and Kenya and uh, in Somalia. Uh, 
can you imagine? Uh, we had a sugar factory in Somalia. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he wrote this, this book on, on grand corruption, which uh, was not particularly popular with some people at the time. And I had a great admiration for that. I mean, he put a lot of, uh, and I liked his analysis. Uh, and he had, when I came to England first at the age of 10 and actually met him, uh, you know, he has he had been through boarding school and gone to university. So I think he was at, uh, must have been at university by the time I got there. And he was, you know, just very helpful. So I had a, a lot of, Unfortunately, he's died now. He had, as I said, polio when he was very young. And he's remarkable. And I've never met a person who was more... I never heard him grumble about a single thing. He, he, he was just entirely positive, which, considering he had a lot of trouble with his, uh, his legs, was mm. quite something. He must have grumbled about the weather a bit. I mean, he is English, yes? Or what? <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't count as grumbling. <laughs> Other people, I don't know. Yes, lots of, lots of, uh, yeah, lots of, a, a lot of people who, uh, uh, you, yeah, thing. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, having lived all around the world, I remember one of, one of my, bosses at the time, a man called Rudy Wegman, who's also uh, died, he gave me some advice, which he said, Mark, if you're going to travel around the world, he said the two things that you must not ever do, don't ever look at the telephone bill, he said, because, because that keeps the family safe, and don't fuss about the travel costs. It's just, you know, part of life. And, and he's absolutely right. I mean, this was before Skype and, you know, when telephone bills were quite serious things. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to, if there's anything else you would like to share about the book, um, perhaps something you feel particularly passionate about, um, something you'd like to share about your, your uh, history, your work. No, I think, uh, I mean, I think if one there are a, a number of things. I, I mean, I think things that we need to to focus on. Uh, one is corruption, because I really do feel that corruption is, uh, you know, corruption, uh, beneficial ownership of corrupt proceeds, which Western governments are not too hot at. I think we've got a lot of work to do, and I do a little bit on, on that, uh, assist other people doing it. Uh, supply chains, I think. Uh, I, I was at a conference in, in London run by an organization called SEDEX, which links suppliers and buyers of different sorts. And its supply chains are a real leverage for sustainability, I think. And, and I, I thought, this is a great organization. They've got 30-something thousand uh, uh, organizations. They've got, a, uh -huh. and a, they've got a board which is split into A, B, and C. And A are, the, are the, the biggies who mainly buy things. Of course, they sell to people as well, but in the supply chain, they're mainly buying things. B are, are the folk who make for the A's and buy from the B's there in the middle. And C are the, the little guys. Uh, and it's really, it's, it, I think they've got it. So I, you know, I'd encourage people to do work on, on supply chain. Uh, yeah. So I think it's corruption, supply chain. And this need that, that, uh, that business people really need to learn to, to take their corporate hat off and look at society and what needs to be done and join in a process of, of saying what could make life better and then when they've hammered through that they put their corporate hat back on and think okay now how can we make money in in 
you know, run a business in, in this uh, uh, engagement. And I think that's a skill that people need to be able to, to have, is to take your corporate hat off. And that's one of the pleasures of being retired. I have <laughs> either no corporate hat or multiple ones, so I don't have to sing any particular song. That's excellent. Well, thank you very much, Sir Mark, for joining us today uh, and sharing your insights and experiences. Um, the uh, book review for the folks who are watching this video right now, the book review uh, can be found at thesustainableleader.org. Um, the book can also be purchased at Greenleaf Publishing as well as Amazon or through your own uh, indie, indie bookstore locally. Um, and again, thank you, Sir Mark, for joining The Sustainable Leader. And, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.